Good morning, graduates. Uh, thank you for that very, very warm welcome. Unexpected, but I, I, I'll take it. Uh, it is uh, a privilege to be here with you this morning, with your esteemed faculty, deans, administrators, families. And I thank you uh, from deep, deep in my gut for this honorary degree. I especially um, want to give a shout out to my mom, who's here today, because as a social worker, <laughs> and, and, and as an early educator, she's really excited about me getting an honorary degree from Leslie. <laughs> And, and dad, now that now when they say Dr. Chang Diaz, they're not going to know if they're talking if we're talking to you or me. Just, you know. So I want to start by going back to January 28th of this year, 10 p.m. It was a Saturday, right here in Boston, in the dead of winter. A group of women rushed to the John Joseph Mowgli Courthouse. One lawyer, Sue Finnegan. She left a gala to go to court. Susan Cohen ditched a 60th birthday party. And Laura Rotolo of the American Civil Liberties Union left her husband and their two children to clean, clean up after her six-year-old's birthday party. Attorney Carrie Doyle carried a copy of the Immigration and Nationality Act under her arm. And Melissa Smith had Girl Scout cookies, thin mints, that she handed out for sustenance. This was the night when airports across the country filled with protesters and confusion reigned among Department of Homeland Security officials, no one knew what was going to happen because of President Trump's Muslim travel ban. The Boston Globe later described how these women in jeans, suits, and ball gowns pled the case before a federal judge and stopped the travel ban from taking effect less than 24 hours after it had first been signed. The story described how these women had been soldiers for justice, standing between an executive order and the people that those orders were targeting. You've got to come through us, they said to the most powerful man in the world. You've got to come through us. These are extraordinary times, aren't they? Scary times. The questions before us today don't just concern voting for one president or another. And it's not as simple as being a Democrat or a Republican. America's faith in our institutions is at an all-time low, buckling under the weight of corruption and unkept promises. The drumbeat of anger and hatred grows ever louder the world over. People look for explanations for the economic distress that they're experiencing. Racism, xenophobia, sexism, and bigotry find new life in the mouths of our leaders. And we face real and present threats to the free press, to our Constitution, to the well-being of our planet, and the health of our families and our neighbors. We must now once again determine who we will be as a people. Do we consent as our peers turn toward violence and fascism, or do we re-anchor ourselves to the fundamental values of equality, justice, and small-d democracy? These are struggles that will play out on the fields of international and national politics, to be sure. But at different times, it will also fall to each of you to be the people who stand in the way of injustice. I look out across this crowd, and I know the powerful impact that you will have in years to come, whether by choice or inaction. For all of you educators, Students of all ages will look to you to learn their ABCs and their algebra, but they will also look to you at other times. This fall, you will meet a scared kid who worries about his mom getting picked up by ICE while he's at school, or a Muslim teenager whose headscarf gets yanked on in class while she's working to master trigonometry, or the Anglo-American girl sitting next to her in class who's quietly watching to see what the adults in the room will do. For those of you who are entering the fields of therapy and counseling, the same families will come to you for guidance, reassurance, treatment, opening up their lives to you. 
you intercultural leaders in this increasingly fractious world. You will find yourselves knitting together, or in some cases holding together, with your two hands, the fragile threads of organizational cooperation and understanding across national lines. And you writers and poets, you can hold a mirror up to us all and mold the soul of America. Yet with all this power, with all this power and capacity, how you approach your work will often feel as though it's not entirely up to you. Throughout your career, you will undoubtedly be asked to meet many different demands. You will have to do basic work efficiently. You'll have to navigate bureaucracies, manage personalities, troubleshoot innumerable obstacles. And it's a foregone conclusion that you will need to impress people, your boss, investors, patients, students, parents, the list goes on and on. Much in this world, in other words, will encourage you to triage your work, to keep your head down, focus on what's right in front of you. One of the most important things that I hope you have already learned in your time here at Leslie is to resist these temptations. Now, more than ever, you must be awake, open, and ready to act in the moments that seem unjust. These moments will come in ways big and small, obvious and shrouded. Department of Energy officials didn't think that they would be asked by an incoming president for a blacklist of staffers who worked on climate change. But that blacklist is exactly what, they were at, what was requested of them in December. They refused. Someday, you might be asked for a list of your employees, your colleagues, your donors, or your clients based on their politics or affiliations or national origin or maybe the kinds of populations that they serve. And you know what else? When these moments arise, it will not always be obvious that a mindful injustice is being done. You might be teaching an AP class and for the fifth or sixth year in a row, there are no kids of color in it. Or maybe you're working in HR at an organization and you notice that there are pay inequities that can keep falling along the lines of race or gender. But in both cases, supervisors will tell you with sincerity that they don't discriminate. White students and the male employees simply have better skills, better preparation, or negotiate harder. Are you keeping your head down or do you keep asking questions? From religious slurs that you'll hear on the tee during your commute to discriminatory immigration laws, from domestic violence in our homes to misogynists on the nightly news, from inequality in our classrooms to vast and growing inequality in our economy, when they come to do these things, they have to come through you. And I'm going to add a little personal note here while we're on this topic. My dad is here today for me and for my little sister who's graduating from the undergraduate college this afternoon. And he's a loving father, an incredible community member, and a patriot. He's the first Latino astronaut in US history. And he But not only that, he has put his life on the line seven times for the United States of America on spaceflight missions. He is also a dual citizen, an immigrant. If you're coming for him, if you are questioning his patriotism because of his passports, then you're going to have to come through me and my little sister. We will bring to that fight all of the skills that our education has imparted to us, all of the heart that our parents have gifted us, and all of the values that this country has taught us. All of you are going to know someone just like that in the coming years, someone who will be unfairly treated and threatened. You'll never know when you will get the call or in what ways it will come. Four months ago, the women who raced to the courthouse that night didn't know that they would be the ones but when the call came, they answered it. And it turns out they brought the full weight 
of the federal government to a screeching halt. It turns out, Citizen actually is the highest office in the land. What I'm asking of you, what I'm asking of you today is not small. And I'm sorry I can't give you a more conventional, more exuberant commencement address. You certainly deserve it. You I can see you guys are equal to the task. You did not, you know, you did not ask for these times or these challenges. But the truth is, of course, no one ever asks for tumultuous waters. Who we are and what we achieve will depend on how we meet this moment. And someday, years from now, your grandchildren will come to you with curious eyes and ask, what did you do? So carry with you the craft that you have honed here at Leslie. Work to do your jobs well, be a credit to the institutions you serve, and help earn back America's fraying trust. Yet most of all, I implore you to be open and be ready. Be awake to the moments when your friends, your colleagues, your communities, or people that you will never meet need you and your solidarity. Be ready and make the purveyors of fear come through you. Congratulations, Godspeed to you, class of 2017.